Just like to let the visitors know, we're having 11 week series on the Holy Eucharist. And tonight is the fifth talk on the Eucharist, and the topic for tonight is the second thousand years in the history of the church. So, the Great Schism in 1054, it was the split between the East and the West. The East and the West, basically over the Pope. The Pope wanting too much power. And of course, the Eastern churches, they, they always recognize the Pope as the first among equals. And that's why you have nine different rites of the Eastern church that's not in union with the Pope. Things like the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, and e over each of those rites you have the patriarchs. And um, there's 23 rites, Eastern rites, that are in union with the Pope, but nine are not. And that happened basically in 1054, it's called the Great Schism. Um, when Constantine gave freedom to the church and we had the Edict of Milan, from then on, the empire, the emperor, would appoint bishops and the pope. And it was very political. There was no separation of church and state like you have it here in the United States. But in 1059, a major breakthrough, cardinals elected the pope rather than the emperor selecting the pope. And that's the way it is today, ever since 1059. In the 11th century, we had our first major heresy with the deacon of Tours, Baron Garius, denying the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. For a thousand years, nobody ever questioned the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Baron Garius did, and he referred to the Eucharist as mere symbol. Naturally, he was challenged, and he had to make a profession of faith in front of the Pope, and he did that in, uh, in, in uh, 1070. We had some great saints around this time. Saints like St. Francis of Assisi, St. Bonaventure, St. Dominic, St. Thomas Aquinas. In uh, 1215, we had the Fourth Lateran Council. The Fourth Lateran Council de defined for us transubstantiation, about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and it also said that every Catholic had to make their Easter duty, go to confession and communion at least once a year. You, you might think that's kind of crazy today, but back then a lot of people didn't think they were worthy to go to communion. So they made the church law, you had to go at least once a year. So uh, that's from the Fourth Lateran Council. In 1227, Stephen Lagton divided the Bible into chapters. Remember when the Bible was written, it, it wasn't written in chapters and verses like we have it today. Stephen Langton divided it into chapters, and then in the 1500s, they put it into verses as well. But a major development with, with, with the Bible was the invention of the printing press in 1450 by Gutenberg. Up to that point, it would take a monk a whole year to make one copy of the Bible. And the copy of the Bible cost, in our terms, about $150,000. And they would chain them to the church so people wouldn't steal them. They were valuable. But once the, 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 the printing press was invented, the first book that was printed on the printing press was the Catholic Bible. And it's good for you to know this. By the time Martin Luther came, the Catholic Church had authorized over 600 different editions of the Bible in many different languages. Sometimes people will say on the internet, Martin Luther gave us the Bible, the Catholics wouldn't let you read it. 
Not true. Before Martin Luther, there was over 600 different editions of the Bible, thanks to the printing press. It became a lot easier. Back in the day, people couldn't own a Bible like, like, like you do today. Uh, people, because they were so expensive. The next big thing I want to talk about, and of course, any one of these topics you could take a whole sermon on. The Reformation. You know, there's no doubt about it. You've heard me say many times, the church is a church of sinners, for sinners, run by sinners. And the church is always in need of reform. And during the time of Martin Luther, it particularly needed reform. And particularly at the Vatican. They were selling indulgences and other things like that. It was more of a business than it was a great spiritual powerhouse. And Martin Luther wanted to reform the church from within, but things kind of got out of hand. And of course, if you don't go along with the Vatican, they excommunicate you. And that's what they did to Martin Luther. And not only Martin Luther, you had other great ones at the time like um, Wingley and John Calvin and John Knox. John Knox started the Presbyterian Church. John Calvin was a great reformer. Martin Luther started the Lutherans. And Henry VIII, this wasn't about theology. It was about wanting a, grand, uh, wanting a child, wanting an heir. And the Pope wouldn't grant him an annulment, so he said, I'll show you. I'll set up my own church. And he put himself in charge of the Church of England, or as we call it in the United States, the Episcopal Church. And the Methodist Church broke away from the Episcopal Church as part of the Anglicans. So just in terms of sheer numbers, let me just give you some numbers. Catholics today, we number about 1.4 billion. The largest Christian denomination in the world, more than all of them put together, okay? The second largest church in Christendom is the Orthodox Church, about 300 million. The, the main churches like the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and the Episcopals, or the Anglicans, they have between 70 and 80 million each. Now, let me say a word about the Anabaptists. They were called the Radical Reformers, and their champion was Zwingli. And Wingley went back to Baron Garius. That's why he's so important. And denied sacramentality. All the sacraments are a waste of time. And Martin Luther and the Reformers were really at loggerheads with Singley and the Anabaptists. And they gave them tremendous persecution because of their views. They thought it was outlandish to deny the validity of the sacraments. Why are they important for us, the Anabaptists? Because from there we get the Baptists and a lot of the churches we have in the United States today. If you Google how many different versions of Baptists do you have? Well, I just did, and counting up on Wikipedia, I, I went over 200. So I'm not sure how many different denominations you have, but they're well over 200. And that's the dominant one around here. And John Smith was the, was the founder of the Baptist Church in 1611. But they were part of that radical reform group John, uh, from, from uh, uh, Wingley. They followed his theology. No sacraments, no priesthood, none of that. Um, then after the Reformation, you had the Counter-Reformation. And this was a great time in the church. Very instrumental were the Jesuits. Ignatius of Loyola started the Jesuits in 1534, and they became great missionaries. And they had the Council of Trent in 1545 to 63, 1563. And the Council of Trent did a great job in reforming the church. They answered in great detail all the objections of the reformers, and they required priests to do at least eight years of training. Up to that point, you kind of went and you served your time. But they raised the level of education for priests. 
And every priest today has some of the same qualifications as a medical doctor. So we're, we're, we're hopefully more educated than they were back then. I don't know if it helps or not, but anyway, that's the way it is. <laughs> one, one of the other things, uh, you know, in 1673 in England, there was tremendous persecution in England. They had the Test Act. And the Test Act meant that if you were Catholic, you could not have a government job or you couldn't serve in, in politics. And in order to be eligible to serve in politics or in the government, you had to take, you had to deny transubstantiation and take communion in the Anglican Church. And there's a lot of martyrs in England because they wouldn't do that. In England also, you had the Oxford movement, movement, 1845. Many of the great theologians, like John Henry Newman, believed that the Catholic Church was the true church, and they came back to the Catholic Church. And um, Pope Pius X, in the early 1900s, he was called the Pope of the Eucharist, and he encouraged all Catholics to go to communion daily, and he reduced the age of First Communion to the age of seven, the way it is today. And then in the, the last century, the 20th century, we had lots of wars, two world wars. But then we had the rise of communism, and about 60 million Catholics were persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. And so they're kind of some of the things to keep in mind. And as we just give you a brief thing about the Mass uh, during the thousand years. It was during the Middle Ages that the terminology changed. The table became an altar. The meal became a sacrifice. The celebrant became a priest. The shift of communion from food for life to adoration of the sacred host caused the church to introduce the Easter duty. The Corpus Christi procession was introduced in 1264. Kneelers was introduced in the Catholic Church around the 1200s. Imagine there was no kneelers in Catholic churches for 1200 years. From the 12th to the 15th century, Mass was like a sacred play. There were three silent prayers by the priest representing the three days Jesus was silent in the tomb. The priest turned five times representing the five appearances of Christ. And at one point, he made the sign of the cross five times, representing the five wounds of Christ. The back of the chasuble was used to display sacred pictures. When we had the heresy of Arbogensianism, ever heard of that before? Arbogensianism. Arbogensianism denied the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So the church, in response to Arbogensianism, started lifting up the body and blood of Christ after the consecration, and they started ringing the bell, reminding the people to look up. Because remember, the priest had his back to the people. So they, were, uh, they, they started to look up. The ringing of the bell was introduced to remind the people of the great consecration. This caused people to run around from church to church just to see the host elevated. This type of reverence led to many good devotions, like... Eucharistic devotion, benediction, exposition, processions. During this time, altar rails were introduced, emphasizing the unworthiness of the laity to come close to the sanctuary. How many of you remember the altar rails? And you had to kneel at the altar rails to get communion? That's where it came from, this time. The Council of Trent in 1545, this was a great council. It ritualized the Mass down to the last detail. The Mass was in Latin, so you could go into any church in the world, and the Mass was exactly the same, with precision, and it was a great universal prayer. And then Vatican II came along in 1962 to 65, and they went back to the old, old Mass, how the Mass was for the first 400 years. And that's what we have today, the old, old Mass with the priest facing you all, like it was before the heresy of Arianism. What was the heresy of Arianism? Told you last week, 
But anyone remember? I'll be giving you a test again next week. <laughs> I don't think I have it next week. Arianism was where they denied the divinity of Christ. And the church reacting to Arianism introduced the sanctuary, the penitential rite, and they made the priest turn his back and face the altar when he was doing the mass. And that's the way it was up until Vatican II. And I remember as a kid, everyone went to church and they brought the rosary beads and they prayed the rosary while the priest said mass up here. And then he, of course, he'd give the sermon, you'd put the rosary beads away for the sermon. And then when he was done with the sermon, you'd go back praying your rosary again. That's the way it was. So Vatican II wanted full conscious and active participation. And whether you like it or not, at least I think the Mass is much better today than it was when I was a kid. And it's the old, old Mass we have today. So thank God for history.